Hey, kids of all ages, you're listening to Mikdash Kids with Judy Simon on Israel National Radio. Welcome back to Mikdash Kids. We're at our second half, and we've been talking about Lot's wife has turned to salt during the destruction of Sodom. She turned around and watched her town being destroyed, and her punishment was turning to salt. Got a lot of questions still about why all of these things happened, so I've invited onto the show Rabbi Eliyahu Shear, who, like Shira Smiles, also teaches Torah all over the world through the Internet. Rabbi Shear, you on with us? I'm here, Judy. I'm so glad that you could join us today. Thank you very much. My first question for you, Rabbi Shear, is about Sodom itself and why it was destroyed. Now, obviously, these people were bad because God chose to destroy them. But could you give us a little more information about what made them so worthy of destruction? Well, one of the fascinating things about this city is that it was a city that thrived on itself In fact, the city had everything that one could ever imagine. It had a goodness of everything, and everybody in the city was taken care of. Uh, One could imagine, for example, living in a paradise whereby everybody in that particular city is able to give to everybody else because they're self-made millionaires. And yet at the same time, even though they were all so wealthy, their biggest problem was that none of them were prepared to give to anybody else. They were not prepared to have anybody else into the city who could not provide for themselves. And basically, if we were to sum up what type of people lived in the city of Sodom, they were multimillionaires who were the most stingy of people you could ever imagine. They had everything, and yet they did not want to part with anything that they had. Hmm. This, of course, was the biggest fault of the city of Sodom. And not only did they not want to part with their own wealth, but they tried to take well, take even from poor people, they tried to take and add to their own wealth. That's right. Now, basically what happened over here is that the city was so stingy that even when it came to a poor person that would pass through the city and have nothing to his name but just a few prudas, for example, imagine like five agarot to his name, well, they would do their best to take the five agarot or the one agarot coins that he had away from him. And in this way, they got away with theft because when it came to the courts, they were unable to prosecute the entire city for stealing just a few agarot coins or a few prutas from a poor person. Mm. In other words, there was a, a particular danger involved over here in that they got away with stealing in small amounts because nobody could say that they had stolen enough to warrant any type of arrest mm. or any type of court case uh, worthy of putting them in prison. So they were just shaving a little off the top from each person, and then it it gathers and gathers and gathers. It could be quite a bit of money, but it's not enough to hire a lawyer and take it to court. That's right. In other words, what, what we're talking about here is something that we have to look at in our own times and appreciate that in our own relationships, we have to be very careful to see that another person's money, the value even of one agarot or five agarot, five cents, ten cents, is worth something. If it's worth something to you, it's worth something to him. And we must be very cautious in our business dealings to the degree that we are not prepared to settle for taking even one cent from Mm. somebody else. Because the one cent theft is the very theft that God cannot take. He cannot deal with a person who is prepared to steal one cent from somebody else. You see, stealing from somebody $100 or $500, well, everybody can see that that's something forbidden. But when we take from each other just a cent or two, and afterwards we claim that we haven't actually taken anything from anybody, that is the ultimate level of theft. It allows us to continue and to take from people in small amounts and get away with it, and nobody will ever complain because there's nothing to complain about when such a small theft occurs. Uh. And also, it just the whole concept of honesty is broken down with just small amounts of theft. They say, "Ah, oh, what is it? It's just a penny or two. What's the big deal?" But it's 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 veering from the path of honesty. That's right. I'd like to share a, a very beautiful story which relates to honesty in business. I think it's one that we can take with us into our lives forever. In 1994, there was a soldier in Israel by the name of Nachshon Vaxman. Some people might remember him. He was captured by the Arabs. And what happened was 
um, when he was captured, his parents put in tremendous effort to do everything that they could to save him. Candles were lit, prayer rallies were held at the Kotel. It seems there was tremendous Jewish unity at this point in time. Unfortunately, the prayers did not help, and Nachshon didn't survive the event. Now, whether the following story is true or not, uh, it still carries a profound lesson for us all and should awaken each of us to realize the importance of honesty in business. And this is the story. At the time when Nachshon had been captured, a young man who had been in a coma awoke, and he requested to speak to one of the leading rabbis of the generation. He had a story to tell him. He said that he had seen a certain elderly woman in his dream, in his dream coma state, and had been given a message from her to tell over. When the rabbi showed the man a picture of his own now deceased wife, he confirmed that this was the woman who delivered the message. She told him that during this period of time, the unity of the Jewish people had been so great that it was appropriate and right that Mashiach would reveal himself, taking us all out of this exile. But there was one thing holding things back, the problems of theft and forbidden money that people had taken through their business activities. Really? Without money, none of us can live. It does make the world go round because it allows us to interact with each other, giving and taking correctly, and ultimately helping each other to live as real people should. Everybody deserves a chance at living in life, living with the most basic necessities that we all want for ourselves. And when we take it into our own hands and we decide what we are going to do in our own honest business, then we take away from the very life of the other person. The other person works just as hard to live as we do in our own businesses. And every person wants the best things in life just like we do, whether it's a house or a car, whether it's clothing, whether it's food. It makes no difference. My desire to live in this world and feel comfortable, praise God, and feel comfortable with living and doing the right thing is as much as a desire and a want for myself as it is for everybody else. And what we have to learn to appreciate is that whatever I've got is to be used to serve Hashem, and I must appreciate that the other person also wants his things to serve Hashem. And therefore, when I take from him even the smallest amount, I say to that person that he is not worth anything. And in fact, when the world was created, as it says a verse in Tehillim, Olam chesed yibane, the world is created on kindness. The only reason that the world exists is because each of us are willing to give to the other person. If it is not for the sake of giving, if there is not a giver and a recipient, then the world cannot stand. The world exists on kindness. Wow. Now, when the city of Sodom was destroyed, this makes sense. The city of Sodom was destroyed because it was a city that was destroyed already. How is that? Because since the city didn't believe in the concept of chesed, of giving, of loving kindness, of doing acts of kindness for each other, but rather insisting on the selfish notion that everything belongs to me no matter how much I have, then in that case the world cannot exist. And therefore, the city of Sodom is destroyed on its own account. It never existed to start off with. And therefore, the physical manifestation of the destruction of Sodom was no more than a reality mm. of the spiritual manifestation of what it was already. Wow. I have a question to ask you about all the things that you've taught. You've said that the people of Sodom didn't have it in their heart to give, and that means that they were already a destroyed city spiritually, so that when God destroyed the people of Sodom, he was destroying them physically. They were already destroyed. My question is regarding Lot's wife. On the one hand, it seems that God wanted her saved because the angels pulled her out of Sodom, but on the other hand, she was turned into a pillar of salt. So where does she fall in the categories that you've talked about? The story goes that there was um, a certain lady that passed by, and this particular lady needed some salt. Well, we all know that when we're eating bread or a, a tasty dish of some kind, the salt gives it that extra special flavor and allows us to enjoy the food that much more. And the story goes that when she had passed by and she had asked for some salt, well, lots of wife was not really interested. After all, why do I need to give somebody just that little extra that they can have to satisfy their lusts? After all, can't a person live with bread alone? Why do they need to have salt? 
how many people are not prepared to give to another because they feel that if the other has the necessities in life that they require, that that little bit extra is just not necessary. It's a luxury. It's a luxury. Well, this is exactly what Lot's wife thought. She said to herself, this person wants a luxury in life, and we don't give luxuries. That is unnecessary. And therefore, God punished her what we call midah, connected midah, measure for measure. Just as she was not prepared to give even a teaspoon of salt to give somebody the benefit of enjoying some food just a little bit more, then when her punishment came and she looked around, she wanted to see what was the excitement that was happening in Sodom, something that she was not worthy to see because she herself had been involved in it, Mm -hmm. then God turned her into the very thing that she could not appreciate, and she became that very thing. Hmm. She became the salt that she wasn't willing to give up. And salt is not an expensive item. It's not like the person was asking for her diamond necklace. Just a few kernels of salt. Of course, that's what we always think when it comes to somebody else who's asking for something just a little bit more than we feel they need in life. It's Uh just a little bit extra that they need, and they can do without it. She was not really interested in going all out, as we say, lifnim mishurat hadin, going a little bit beyond the letter of the law, mm-hmm. something that we really should do, because if this world is going to exist in olam chesed yibaneh, it must exist on kindness, not just on something that is a necessity, that's something we must do, but rather it's something that's an act of total kindness. Going above and beyond. Beyond, that's correct. Okay. Rabbi Shear, you've given us so many wonderful things to think about. I love it. You really, you, you've clarified it so nicely. Thank you very uh, much. Did you want to give the, the Mikdash Kids listeners around the world a message? Well, I thought that it would be quite appropriate just to give a bit of a connection that today, of course, is the Yotzat of Rachel Imenu, our foremother, Rachel. And we know, of course, that everybody... Uh, really loves her to a degree that everybody will go and daven at her grave. Uh, Men and women, something uh, quite unique. Many times people go to the graves of Tzadikim, who are men only, but here we see everybody is rushing towards the grave of Rachel Imenu. Now, what type of a woman was Rachel Imenu? After all, it's very strange. Rachel is actually the mother of Yosef and Binyamin. And as we know throughout Jewish history, uh, it comes out that the Jewish people that are currently living as a result of the dispersion and the loss of the ten tribes, are really only Yehuda and Levi in particular. And, uh, and therefore, how come is it that the Jews of today are going to daven at the grave of a woman who isn't really even our mother as such? She's the mother of certain tribes, but she's not the mother of, for example, the tribe of Yehuda. Rachel Imenu represents the very character that every single Jew should internalize inside himself. It is the ultimate midah, the ultimate attribute that a Jew needs to internalize. Rachel Imenu was prepared to give of herself completely to her sister in order that her sister could have the merit of being married to Yaakov, bringing in, in fact, the majority of the tribes of the Jewish people and ultimately being the mother of Mashiach. But ironically, even though that's the case, We regard Rachel Imenu as our mother because she represents the ultimate trait of what every Jew should aspire towards, and that is that it is selfless giving. Rachel Imenu is prepared to give of herself without thinking about the least of the least of being a stingy person. All she desires the most is that the other should have what they desire. She was the ultimate goodness that that what a Jew is supposed to strive for in that she was willing to give selflessly. There was no selfishness in her. All that she wanted to do was to make sure the right thing, the will of God, would be fulfilled. And she wanted that nobody should be embarrassed, that everybody should have what they want if they desire it. She cried, and she cries today for that very same reason. What she desires most is that a Jew looks out for the needs and the desires of another Jew in a selfless way, not a selfish way, not I have and therefore you can't have, but I have and I will give you whatever it is that you need, even if it seems to me like I will lose out on something. In fact, when a person behaves like that, they are put on a much higher level as we see that there is Rachel and she continues to cry and we continue to go to her grave and we say, Mama Rachel, please answer our tefillahs because you are the only one who understands 
what true selfless giving mm. is all about. The absolute midah that every Jew needs to internalize and to fulfill in his life right now. That's the opposite, exactly the opposite of the people of Saddam. That's it. Wow. So we need to learn from Mama Racha and be giving and go above and beyond and generous and give with all our heart as opposed to being like the people of Saddam who were selfish and stingy and didn't want to give really anything of their own. What a beautiful idea. Thank you so much, Rabbi Shear. Thank you very much. Rabbi Eliyahu Shear, how can we get in touch with you if we want to listen to your Torah online? Well, I have a, a website, and in fact, I recently, just a few months ago, I changed the name of the website to reflect exactly the activities that I'm involved in, which, which, is, which are the activities of loving kindness. And anybody who wants to see what I do and what we're involved in just needs to go to the site called lovingkindness.co. Loving kindness, that's all one word, dot that's C-O? That's right. That's all it is, lovingkindness.co, and people will be able to see exactly the activities that we are involved in, which are indeed acts of loving kindness to give and to help others. Wow. So I guess it was even more appropriate than I realized to yeah. have invited you onto this show, yeah. where we focus on the, the loving kindness of Rachel Imenu and the opposite, the, the thing that we must separate ourselves from, distance ourselves from, which was the selfishness of Saddam. Thank you so much, Rabbi Shear, for being on the show today. Thank you very much for having me.